History is often relegated to a list of names and places and dates. However, the reality is that history is about real people with many of the same struggles faced today. The stories of the past connect us with those who came before. Bartholomew County historian Susanna Jones knew that and wanted to convey to everyone that history can be fun and engaging. In 1985, she wrote an excellent book that covered the first 60 years since our county's founding. Obviously, then as now, there is so much history to document, it would be impossible to capture everything. Still, every story has a beginning, and as Susanna's title states, in our case, it began with Bartholomew. General Joseph Bartholomew was born in 1766. In 1798, Bartholomew brought his family to the newly created Indiana Territory. He gained fame as a military officer, and this is where he met General John Tipton. Both fought at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811 against a powerful Native American alliance formed by the Shawnee leader Tecumseh. However, it was his brother Tenskwatawa that led the forces into battle against his brother's wishes. The Native forces suffered a devastating loss that would have repercussions for decades. Bartholomew and Tipton served in the Indiana State Legislature together and were two of the ten commissioners chosen to select the site of the new state capital, which would become the city of Indianapolis. Though they were of different political parties, Tipton introduced the 1821 legislation to name the newly formed Bartholomew County after his commander and friend. The generals were no different from any other white inhabitants at that time and believed they were more civilized than the Native Americans. Tipton and Bartholomew spent their military careers fighting indigenous peoples and negotiating often lopsided treaties that allowed white settlers to claim these lands. While some of these actions by our ancestors are cruel by today's standards, we must put them into the context of their times. Should men like Bartholomew and Tipton be held up as heroes? Should they be viewed as villains on the wrong side of history? Or perhaps both? Current and future generations will decide those important questions. After the Northwest Territory was established in 1787, increasing numbers of settlers arrived in the area that would eventually become Indiana. The state was settled from south northward with most early towns located near the Ohio River. Over the next century, many people came for the cheap and abundant land, and many moved here because of their religion. Bartholomew County was no exception. Old Union Church in German Township was founded by Christians from Virginia and North Carolina, German Lutherans settled around White Creek in the southwest part of the county. The first Methodist Episcopal Circuit and the first Methodist Church in Bartholomew County were established in Flat Rock Township in 1821, the same year the county was founded. Much of eastern Bartholomew County was also settled in great part by groups of people who arrived and quickly started church communities. Often, towns sprang up around these early churches. In Hall Creek Township, the oldest church community was the Old St. Louis Methodist Episcopal Church, founded in 1829. Old St. Louis is an unincorporated area northwest of Hope that was founded in 1836 and was the same size as Hope for a short time. Two other very early Methodist churches in eastern Bartholomew County were the church in Petersville in Clay Township, founded in 1850, and the church in New Bern in Clifty Township, founded in 1859. Petersville was located on the Hope Pike, which today is East 25th Street. New Bern was located further east and north on the road to Hartsville, which is today State Road 46 East. While neither Petersville nor New Bern was ever incorporated, both communities had their own post offices in the late 19th century, and both Methodist church congregations survive and remain active. In Hawk Creek Township, although the first settlers were Methodist, the township was shaped by the development of Hope, which was founded by a group of Moravians, and which is the second largest town in Bartholomew County. The Moravian Church is one of the oldest Protestant denominations in the world. Founded in Eastern Europe in 1457, early Moravians were persecuted for protesting for change in the Roman Catholic Church. In the 1700s, many Moravian worshippers found refuge in modern-day Germany. Beginning in the 1730s, Moravians began arriving in America as missionaries, with the primary goal of spreading their religious teachings to Native Americans. Moravian American communities were called economies because they were organized to raise money for the missions. 
The two largest economies in America were in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania and Salem, North Carolina. The Moravians who came to Hall Creek Township were the first immigrants with German heritage in Bartholomew County. In the 1820s, Martin Hauser, a Moravian farmer from North Carolina, visited his brother who was living as a squatter in northern Bartholomew County in the Hall Patch, which was the area between the Flat Rock River and Hall Creek. Martin Hauser recognized the value of the fertile farmland, and in the fall of 1829, his family and five other Moravian families moved from Salem, North Carolina, across the Appalachian Mountains in wagons to settle in Hall Creek Township. With the support of the Moravian Church, Hauser purchased land for the expansion of the denomination into the Midwest, and Hope was founded in 1830 as a Moravian settlement. Originally known as Goshen, the name was changed to Hope in 1834, when the post office was established to avoid confusion with another town in northern Indiana. The first church service of the Hope Moravian community took place in the summer of 1830. Martin Hauser eventually became the pastor of the church and served the congregation until 1847. Hauser later founded several other Moravian congregations during his lifetime, including another church in Bartholomew County called Enon Church near Clifty Creek and others in Indianapolis and Illinois. Today, the Hope Moravian Church is the only remaining Moravian church in Indiana. Over the years, the Hope Moravian Church has had three buildings. The first was a log structure on land that would become the Hope Town Square. The building was not finished in time for the first service in June of 1830, and to provide shade on the roofless structure, leafy branches were placed across the top. A commemorative rock on the north side of the Hope Town Square marks the location of this first building. The second church was located on Main Street on current church property. It is seen on the left in this photo. It was a wood frame structure with a cupola. When the church outgrew the building in the 1870s, a larger, more permanent brick structure was built north of the older church and the church parsonage. The third church building was finished in 1874, and although the exterior of the tower has changed slightly, the building appears much as it did over 100 years ago and still has an active congregation. Martin Hauser left Hope before this building was constructed to start a new church in West Salem, Illinois. He came back to Hope for the building's dedication and died while he was here. He is buried in West Salem. The frame church building remained standing for many years until it was torn down in 1954. This bell tower with the church's original bell stands on the grounds to commemorate the site of the second church building. Because Moravians were such an early Protestant denomination, they are credited with many firsts in worship. Moravians introduced music into services and wrote and used the first hymn book. They introduced the Love Feast, which is a simple meal celebrating unity and faith in church. In addition, the Moravians were the first to use the sunrise service as part of Easter celebrations. Moravians had very progressive ideas regarding education as well. They believed in educating all, including young children and girls. The Moravians supported kindergarten and locally had a boarding school for teenage girls known as the Hope Moravian Seminary. Young ladies from all over the Midwest came here to live and go to school. The seminary stood on a hill across the road from the church, as seen in this early map. The gates at the bottom of the hill on the church property today are a memorial to the Hope Moravian Seminary, which once stood across the street. The seminary was open from 1866 to 1891. After financial difficulties led to its closing, the building was used for almost 20 years for a different kind of school, a two-year college offering teacher training, business, science, and the arts, called the Hope Normal and Business School. The Hope Normal School operated between 1880 and 1898, and many local teachers of the day received their training in Hope. After the Normal School also closed for financial reasons, the building was torn down and the land divided and sold as residential lots. As with most churches, the Hope Moravian Church reserved space for a cemetery from the beginning. The oldest part of the original Moravian Cemetery is called God's Acre. In the 1870s, the Moravian Seminary principal and teacher, Reverend Francis Holland, planted huge, graceful Norwegian blue spruce trees behind the church at the entrance of the cemetery. The alleyway of trees was called the Avenue of Spruce and was used during the traditional Moravian Easter sunrise service, a tradition that continues today. 
The congregation meets inside the sanctuary before dawn and follows the brass choir or band out the doors through the tree-lined path to the God's Acre, where the worship service concludes. After 150 years, the original majestic trees were not in good shape, and the church removed them with plans to plant new trees along the avenue. God's Acre dates to 1833 when the first burial occurred of a three-year-old child. The traditional Moravian cemetery looks much different than many other cemeteries. The Moravians believe that all people are equal in the eyes of God at death, and for that reason, all the grave markers are flat so as to not attract attention to any one stone or individual. Additionally, God's Acre is not organized by families, but instead by Moravian social and peer groups, which were called choirs. There were sections for married men, married women, unmarried men, unmarried women, boys and girls, and a potter's field, which was a burial ground for the poor. Other Moravian churches also called their cemeteries God's Acre, and larger God's Acre cemeteries can be found in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, and Old Salem, North Carolina, where the first Moravian communities in America were established. Although Hope was founded as a Moravian community in 1836, the town opened up to non-Moravians when plots of land were put up for sale at public auction. Like many other small towns, Hope was laid out around an open public square with businesses surrounding that square. The Hope Town Square is visible in this 1870s-era map of Hope. Since the town's founding, the square has long been a gathering spot, as seen in this early 20th century photo. Another feature on many small town squares was the bandstand. In Hope in the 1920s, the volunteer town band would give free concerts from the bandstand on Saturday nights. Many residents would come into town to hear the band and visit with friends and neighbors. It was considered a huge honor to be in the town band, and members wore uniforms and observed a strict moral code. The Yellow Trail Museum is across State Road 9 from the square. This is the History Museum of Hope and the surrounding area and includes the bed in which Martin Hauser died, a model of the Moravian Girls Seminary, and vintage green wool uniforms with yellow trim worn by the Hope Town Band. The Yellow Trail name harkens back to a local business's famous marketing campaign. Across the square on the south side is a building with a limestone block dated 1915. This was the location of Spa's Garage, an early automobile repair shop. As a form of advertising to local businesses, Elda Spa painted a yellow band at eye level on all the telephone poles along the roads leading to Hope. Motorists could follow the yellow trail to his business. Mr. Spa sold his three-section garage in 1936, but the Yellow Trail legacy he created lives on. The Yellow Trail Museum also includes a tribute to rural mail delivery. In 1896, Hope was one of the first towns in the United States to experiment with mail delivery to individual homes located out in the country. Before rural free mail delivery, farm families came to town to pick up their mail at the post office. For some, this might mean they would get their mail only once a week or maybe once a month. The rural free delivery experiment tested the idea of delivering mail free of charge to each county household. It was a popular success, and for over 125 years, people who live in the country and the city have had mail delivered to their neighborhoods and homes. Norman's Funeral Home on the southwest corner across State Road 9 from the square is the oldest business in Hope owned continuously by one family. In 1865, sawmill owner E.A. Norman began making coffins as a service to the community. The funeral home is still a Norman family business five generations later and is located in a two-story brick building built in 1901. This log cabin located just off the Hope Town Square was built near Hartsville in 1837 by Christian Spaw. The Norman family moved it to this location in the 1970s to celebrate the heritage of the area. The architectural style of the cabin is single pen log construction built with hewn logs in a one room rectangular structure with a sleeping loft above. Just south of Hope on the campus of Hope Elementary and Hauser Junior Senior High School stands a tribute to local history that is keeping history alive for children to experience learning in a one-room schoolhouse. Welcome to Simmons School, where the present meets the past. 
This district school was located three miles northwest of Hope and was built in 1879. Students came to class here, grades one through eight, until 1906. It was always a passion of former superintendent Glenn Keller to restore a one-room schoolhouse so that students could step back in time and spend the day. So in 1988, the Hauser historians began to document dilapidated one-room schoolhouses in this area, and they fell in love with this one. This was the one to be relocated and restored. The fundraising began with elementary school children bringing in $1 to move the school one foot, and the whole community joined in so that by September the 19th, 1989, the Simmons School rolled down State Road 9 to this very location, and it was a glorious day. Barb Johnson and the One Room Schoolhouse Committee continued to raise funds, there were a lot of ice cream socials, until we were able to restore this building to its former grandeur. Now students come from all over the state, stepping across this threshold and listening to the peal of the bell of the original one-room schoolhouse. Will you join me? When students come to Simmons School, they're immersed in the 1892 school day. They come in costume, they bring an old-fashioned lunch in a lunch pail, they practice ciphering, on a slate and read from McGuffey's readers. They like to write with a flare with pen and ink. At noontime, they shoot marbles and walk on stilts and sometimes play Andy Over, where they kick the ball over the schoolhouse. There were 45 students registered to Simmons School and no one had to walk more than two miles to get here. Older children taught younger children, and somehow they managed to get through it, including orthography and physiology. The teachers were women, and they were also responsible for maintenance of the building. It was not unusual to see students carrying coal or cleaning lamp chimneys. When the Hauser historians did oral history with people who had gone to one-room schoolhouses, they learned some interesting things. They learned that the district scholar was responsible for their own learning. They learned too that they were lucky to get to go to school. Many students had to stay home and help with the harvest or with that new baby. They learned that recess was the best and that programs and socials were attended by the entire community and the teacher was an important part of that community. In 1957, Flat Rock and Haw Creek townships consolidated to build a junior-senior high. They named that junior-senior high after the town's founder from the 19th century, Martin Hauser. The mascot chosen, the contemporary Jets. Flat Rock and Hall Creek Townships are the only Bartholomew County townships with their own school corporation. The Flat Rock Hall Creek School Corporation consists of one school complex located just south of Hope on State Road 9 and including Hope Elementary and Hauser Junior Senior High School. When the consolidation occurred in 1957, it brought together students from Clifford, Hartsville, and Hope. Southeast of Hope and Simmons School lies Schaefer Lake, a 100-acre private residential community created in the late 1950s. Albert Schaefer hoped to develop a water sports recreation area near Hope after a family vacation in Minnesota. Schaefer purchased flood land from several local farmers, cleared the trees, and built a dam on Duck Creek. By 1959, the lake was full, and the following year, a bathhouse was constructed and a public beach created with truckloads of sand. For many years, people flocked to the beach in warm weather. As the beach became popular, Schaefer developed some of the land around the lake into residential lots. In the early 1980s, the beach was closed in order to construct more homes on the open lots. Today, Schaefer Lake is home to about 100 residences. Southwest of Hope and Schaefer Lake, just off State Road 9, is a cemetery which connects Bartholomew County to the American Revolution. Sharon Cemetery is located in the northeast corner of Clay Township. 
north of Clifty Creek. Once there was a church here as well, Sharon Baptist Church, which was the earliest church founded in the area in 1823. The church is now gone, but the cemetery remains. Here, in a quiet country graveyard, lie the remains of Jonathan Moore, who fought in the American Revolution. Moore was born in New York, but lived in Bartholomew County later in life. In 1776, Jonathan Moore was a member of an elite group of soldiers who served as bodyguards for General George Washington. Members of this prestigious lifeguard had to be young, active, and well-made, and stand between 5 feet 8 inches and 5 feet 10 inches tall. Washington was 6 feet 3 inches tall, and the historians believe Washington wanted to stand tall on the battlefield above all men, including those who were guarding his life. The lifeguards wore buckskin breeches, blue coats, and black felt hats, and came from all 13 original states. They were present with Washington at all of his Revolutionary War battles and were paid $6.60 a month. And Jonathan Moore fought at Monmouth and Valley Forge, and he was present at the surrender at Yorktown. After the war, Moore retired to Bartholomew County, where he was a popular figure in military and history celebrations in Bartholomew County. He lived to the age of 99. His original tombstone is still present in Sharon Cemetery with a weeping willow tree engraved on it. Today, there is a second, newer grave marker behind the old one, which is easier to read. Jonathan Moore Pike, the main road in and out of Columbus on the west side of town, is named for this Revolutionary War veteran. Just down the road from Sharon Cemetery is the Enon Cemetery. The Enon Church, located southwest of Hope, was the second local Moravian congregation founded by Martin Hauser, who preached the first sermon in German in April of 1844. The church building itself was not constructed until 1846. The congregation eventually dwindled and joined the Hope Moravian Church in 1926. The church building then stood empty for 50 years until it was burned down by vandals in 1976. A small sign explains the history of the church and the stone foundation of the structure and remnants of the Enon Cemetery pay tribute to its past. Northeast from the Enon Cemetery near the eastern edge of Bartholomew County is the town of Hartsville. Hartsville is another small town that is built around a public square. Located in Hall Creek and Clifty Townships near the Decatur County line, Hartsville was founded in 1832. Hartsville has had a post office since 1838, and the town has had several famous historical connections. On the Hartsville Town Square is a historic marker celebrating an important Civil War veteran who is buried north of town. His name was Private Barton Mitchell. In the fall of 1862, Mitchell's Union Army Regiment was camping near Frederick, Maryland in an area that had been previously occupied by Confederate troops. After dinner, Mitchell and a fellow soldier noticed something on the ground, a piece of paper wrapped around three cigars. The two men turned in their find to their superior officers. The paper was a copy of Special Order 191, Confederate General Robert E. Lee's detailed plan for the movement of Confederate troops. This information gave the Union a major advantage and allowed Union generals to adjust their strategy based on what Lee was planning. Two battles immediately followed Mitchell's finding of Lee's lost orders the Battle of South Mountain, and the Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest battle in all of Civil War history. Over 33,000 men died at Antietam, and it is considered a turning point in the Civil War, which led to President Abraham Lincoln issuing the Emancipation Proclamation. Mitchell was discharged after he was severely wounded in the Battle of Antietam and came to live in Hartsville, where his wife had moved with her family. He died in 1868 and is buried in a quiet cemetery northwest of the town near Clifty Creek. Mike Hope, Hartsville once had an institute of higher learning called Hartsville College. It began as Hartsville Academy, a two-story frame school started by the town as a public school in 1850, but the United Brethren Church took it over for financial reasons a short time later. A rock monument and plaque commemorate the school's original location near the center of the square. Around 1865, a new, larger brick building was built on a campus on the south side of town. One of the more interesting stories about Hartsville College is the famous family associated with the school. Both parents of the Wright brothers, inventors of the airplane, attended Hartsville College. Susan and Milton Wright met in Hartsville as students in 1853. 
After the Wrights were married, they initially lived elsewhere and had several children. In 1868, Milton Wright took a job at Hartsville College and the family returned to Bartholomew County. Milton served as the presiding elder and pastor of the local church and professor of theology at Hartsville College from 1868 to 1869. Wilbur Wright was born in 1867 near Millville, Indiana, before the Wrights moved to Bartholomew County, but lived in Hartsville with his family as a young child. About a year later, the family moved to Dayton, Ohio, where Orville was born. Hartsville College was one of the first co-educational institutions of higher learning in the United States, educating both men and women. Several local prominent citizens either taught or attended here. One of these was Samuel Wirtz, who taught at Hartsville College and was the longest-serving principal of Columbus High School. He also played a role in the founding of Indiana Central College, now called the University of Indianapolis. Lucretia Shuck Kondo graduated from Hartsville College and became a Latin teacher and dean of girls at Columbus High School. Hartsville College closed in 1897, but faculty and alumni were loyal and held reunions into the mid-20th century. The brick building burned down shortly after the school shut down. The grassy plaza of the campus is now residential, but a sign that reads College Street remains there. There's also a cemetery where many of the students and teachers are buried. South of Hartsville in Clifty Township is Anderson Falls, a spectacular Bartholomew County geologic feature which has been popular with locals for over 150 years. The falls are located on the Fall Fork of Clifty Creek near the Decatur County line. Although it was well known by locals for more than a century, Anderson Falls was dedicated as a county park in 1983 with hiking trails that cover 44 acres. This area was once occupied by Native Americans. In the 19th century, David Anderson ran a grist mill near the falls downstream, and the area is named for Anderson and his family. A small town called Camden was also once located here. It was planted south and east of the falls early in the 1800s by men who discovered a mineral spring nearby and felt this water source warranted a town. However, Camden never developed, and by the middle of the 19th century, it was gone. By the early 20th century, the mills were gone, but the area was a popular place for local youth to gather. Anderson Falls is 50 feet across and 13 feet high. At various times throughout the year, the view of the falls is quite different, depending on how much water is flowing. In the spring, visitors can see beautiful early wildflowers, and the entire creek bed is blooming with bluebells. With spring rains, the falls become quite spectacular. Even the frozen falls in the winter are a sight to behold. When the creek is dry, it's easy to see the geology of the area, which is caused by the same geologic features that are found at the famous Niagara Falls. The top layer of rock is hard limestone over soft shale that easily breaks and wears away, leaving the layer of hard limestone exposed and unsupported. Big chunks of limestone eventually break off into the creek below, and for this reason, the entire falls is slowly eroding upstream. While Anderson Falls is open year-round, there is no bridge over the creek, so visitors must walk through the creek to access the park's hiking trails, a feat which is dangerous with significant water flowing. In the 1960s and 70s, the falls were threatened by a plan for a dam and reservoir which would have flooded the area and hidden the falls forever. Planning began in the 1960s to create the Clifty Creek Reservoir by damming the creek south of the falls. The plan was intended to decrease flooding and to create a larger lake for residential and recreational use. Planners projected 200,000 visitors a year might visit the area. In preparation, the town of Hartsfield spent a large amount of money in 1970 on a sewer system they would be able to handle the additional homes. When the federal funding for the project disappeared and many local citizens protested the environmental cost, the project was eventually abandoned. And as a result, the town of Hartsville suffered financially. The town's incorporation charter was almost revoked in 1981 as it struggled to pay its bills. The town survived in the end, and the natural beauty of the falls was preserved. The southeastern part of Bartholomew County, south of Anderson Falls, has an interesting claim to fame. Although this area is not at the center of the county, it was the center of the United States population in 1900. 
Since 1790, the U.S. government has conducted a census of all residents every 10 years. Part of the calculation of the data includes identifying the location of the mean center of population. This is the point at which the U.S. population is equal both north, south, east, and west. At the time of the first census, the mean center of population was in Maryland, and it has moved steadily west across the United States every 10 years. In 1900, the center of population was located on Henry Mars Farm near the border of Rock Creek and Columbus Townships. A granite marker was dedicated the following year to commemorate the spot for the public. Eventually, it was moved, but it is still present along State Road 7 in the southeast corner of the county. A smaller stone marker with a simple 1900 inscribed was placed at the exact location of the center of population at the time and remains in place on private property. Rock Creek Township includes the small, unincorporated communities of Burnsville and Grammar. Burnsville was founded in 1845 and had 200 residents near the end of the 19th century. Grammar was founded in 1890 after the railroad was built from Elizabethtown to Westport in Decatur County. Grammar was originally known as Cushman or Springer, and not until 1893 was the name changed for good. In the early 20th century, both Burnsville and Grammar had two-room brick schoolhouses, but neither had enough students to have a separate high school. Instead, they alternated which school housed the high school students from both communities until 1924, when all high school students began attending Columbus High School. The Burnsville School is still standing and has been repurposed as a home. The Grammar School, which was designed in 1899 by prominent local architect Charles Sparrow, continued to be used as an elementary until 1958 when a new Rock Creek Elementary was built. The old building was torn down in 1998 and the land converted to a county park with a stone memorial to the school. During World War II, Grammar had a brief moment of fame when the Grammar Auxiliary Flying Field was established as one of five auxiliary landing fields for military pilots who were training at Freeman Field in Jackson County. Two of the five landing fields were located in Bartholomew County, including this one near Grammar and one near Walesboro in Wayne Township. Four farm families living in Rock Creek Township were given just two months in the fall of 1942 to vacate their land for the construction of three grass runways. In contrast to Camp Atterbury and the Atterbury Bacolor Airport, the Grammar Flying Field was not used for long and was sold for surplus in 1945 and eventually returned to farming. A significant recreational complex was added to Western Rock Creek Township in 1963 by Cummins Engine Company. It was called Sarah Land, the Cummins Employee Recreation Association, and was built on the former 345-acre Keller Farm as a corporate facility for Cummins employees and their families. In 2014, the park opened to public membership when Cummins turned the park over to a nonprofit managing company. Services often include camping, rental cabins, an aquatic center, and an indoor sports complex. The grounds include a number of outdoor boarding facilities, and Sarah Land hosts many special events every year, including popular fireworks shows on the 4th of July. The eastern part of the county is a mostly rural area, but the stories from Hope and Hartsville, from area churches and schools, and from the many people who have called this region home are all part of the rich history of Bartholomew County that connects us all. For over a century, the Bartholomew County Public Library and the Bartholomew County Historical Society have worked to discover, collect, preserve, and share the stories of the people who made Bartholomew County what it is today. We are indebted to the previous work of individuals who believed, as we do, that the knowledge of our collective history is critical to understanding our present and as a valuable tool for informing the future. People like George Pence, Vida Newsom, Ross Crump, Susanna Jones, Harry McCauley, and Tammy Stone Iorio all made it their life's work to think about the generations who came after and to make sure our history was not lost. No matter if your family has been here since the county's founding in 1821 or if you recently located here, Bartholomew County's story is your story. Be inspired by those that came before you and determine 
from their struggles and their triumphs, what can be your story and how can you make an impact? History is happening every day. Don't let it pass you by. We're very grateful and excited to be a part of this lifelong journey with you.